we'll try to trade a little bit here on the topic. I said I'll just steal it from PowerPoint's dad's done other places. So. <laughs> One of the things we try to hit the topic of interplanting a little bit more. Uh, so I've got pictures I've ripped off the internet of all kinds of different tools here. Uh, just talk a little bit about, and we can start, you know, for our, uh, we got started with the multi uh, cover crop species that blends together was with that twin row or the splitter row planter, you know, running peas and radish which is probably an excellent way uh, for to get started. If you've got wheat or oats or something in your rotation, uh, to utilize the planter that you have if you've got a splitter planter. A very economical way to put down the, the peas and the, the radish, and it does excellent front corn. So it's a, it's a really good starter. Uh, the only downside that we have is that it's a winter kill. You know, so you, you have a little bit of a leaky system in the spring, but again, it's kind of a, one of those stepping tools that we can use uh, to get, it depends on your, your strategy and what you've got, too. Uh, here's soybeans uh, interplanted in corn. So that's another one that seems to work well in uh, drier years, uh, from our experience so far, as far as uh, getting some yield out of that. I haven't seen much benefit in wet years, but a dry year seems to have some benefit on that. And that's planted at the same time. Uh, soybeans planted at the same time as corn. Yeah, question in the back. Yeah, again, on the soybeans, you count on them for any next year for the corn? That's the thought, yes. Okay. So essentially, you would not need the side dress, potentially, based on that. So it says if you're using traded, you know, Roundup corn, you got Roundup soybeans, so you don't have to worry about your chemical program. Looks good. So this is what can happen, though. <laughs> uh, since you're, you know, the soybeans can get real competitive depending on what you got, so you have to watch out for that. Yeah, anytime you put two uh, warm season legume and a warm season grass together, you have that risk. You know, that's why we like to stick with the cool season grass or cool season legume. In, in this kind of scenario. Yep. But if you're chopping silage, it might be a good thing. Yeah. Yep. Let's break all the rules. That's right. <laughs> and this, this is the example that we've used for years about the FFA plot that showed that yield advantage. Uh, and this was in that dry year. Uh, so we have not necessarily duplicated or replicated exactly, but we've seen that again in dry years where the interplanted soybeans do offer some advantage. Seed growth had to start somewhere, right? So spreading cover crops on top of corn this way uh, is one way to do it. And, you know, any type of broadcast application, whether it's with the air boom or with the spare spreader ways that you can get out there and utilize equipment that you have, right? I think you had this picture before again. So again, using equipment that you have, right? Combined uh, so the Lilliston, Lilliston cultivator. See that in the organic world. So And with the legume box, in this case you'd be using small seeded stuff when we talk about the cool season. Uh, you could probably put maybe annual ryegrass and clovers through there and it would work just well from that standpoint. Get a little bit of a corporation. So that's the key. We talked about a little bit of seed and soil contact to help with any issues you might have with emergence. There's your... Yeah, and that's one reason we use the rotary hoe uh, on black sands where, you know, that top half inch dries out real fast. Um, this enables us, you know, to get, get that inner ryegrass down there a little bit. So this is actually out of Europe. So this is a European conventional farmer putting on uh, cover crops after second cultivation. That's the point. A lot of guys here domestically, we had know some folks in Ohio that do this uh, in their organic operation as well. Again, using old tools to do a new job for you, right? A little broadcast spinner that just kicks it out as wide as in the side dress toolbar there. So again, 
a little bit more advanced tool <laughs> to do the same job. Uh, we have, that's one of the first generations of the Dawn Duo Seed unit. Here's one of their the most recent ones up front, which you've had a chance to look at. So you can build two bar to do whatever you want from that standpoint, to seed cover crops or build your own uh, basically grain drill out of. Uh, they say you can apply dry fertilizer through as well. So you just you know, have to buy seed to a little more on. What's the largest seed you can run through that? I don't have much experience with this per se. As big as your, whatever metering device you've got. Okay. So the C2 is a good inch in diameter. So, so this uses, I think, a case style offset disc opener mount. And here's an example of it on a toolbar. This happens to be the Pennsylvania. Right, so Armin and Jim Hershey there put this one there. Uh, Lauren Steinlegi out in Iowa has his unit, so he plants uh, twin row soybeans, twin row cereal rye, does the uh, inter planting relay cropping scenario on that. So he's really kicking that up a, a notch in his practice. My tutor's rig, right? Mike? Yeah, so here he's got his uh, nitrogen side dress bar set up with the uh, Dawn units. So there's a lot of options as far as what, what you can do, again, using that tool. This is the uh, interseeder, one of the earlier pictures of the uh, interseed tech before they went to the blue color. Where you can take the row units out, where it's a regular grain drill, and then you take the row units out, and skip the row. As an example here. They can build those in size configuration as well, so there's a lot of options to build those types of machines. When we saw pictures for the application, different type, because he has, uh, they've gone from the candy box to the salver type box now, uh, to try to do like, either fertilizer or seed, so you get a lot more utility on that. be on any size machine, you know, so you're just limited by kind of your imagination and pocketbook at that point. <laughs> That's what it's like with the cap, driving in a corn there. And what the seat looks like on the ground from that ground rig. This is one we tried to, to intercede uh, so we it's a beat. Not very successful. But it was worth a shot. Okay. So in here where we talk about the timing of the seeding, what we want to look at in that time frame. A lot of people are we're, we're spending a lot of time at how early do you go and where do you get the best benefit. Uh, this is a plot that I put out with a hand spinner. Uh, driving a drop here, a spinner through the corn, just kind of did that on a plot. Uh, I think a seven way clover mix worked out really well in this scenario. Hey, Jay, you need to change microphone. Yeah. That's what I figured. Yeah, and I don't, I mean, you can get stuff to come up when you see it in the spring, you know, in knee high corn. But my real question is how do you get it, ensure that it lives? so that it's there in the fall and next spring. Um, and, and I've just seen the least consistency with both. You know, some years it works and other years it doesn't. And, and we still, I think it's that shading period in the fall. It's that that becomes that critical. Because they're shade tolerant, but that's asking a lot, um, depending on what kind of shade period you do have. So Dan, Dan and Jay, in that regard, the uh, guys in Quebec that have been very successful have started interseeding when the corn is three leaves tall. So when the corn reaches canopy then, that root has enough reserves to sustain itself. Do you think there's any validity or value to that potentially in this environment as we're further south? Yeah, so uh, Blake's point about you know, the folks that originally kind of started doing this at scale now are going, you know, three-leaf stage, 
they figured out the herbicide program enough to be able to do that, you get a, you get more growth, and so you get more root reserve, and so you can outlast that shade period. Um, and I think so. I think the further south you are, and you guys again on the southern fringe of that, this is going to become more and more important. Yeah, all, all 30 so far. Uh, hopefully, after this year, we'll have you know quite a bit more experience with corn silage because that's that's a big crop in our area. Um, you know, the folks in Upper New York State where it's working on corn silage, they've done it in 20 inch rows. Uh, and I, I don't think that so much matters there because again, it's the critical factors are: is there enough time to get the cover crop established so it has enough root reserve, and then to outlast that shade period. And the beauty of corn silage is it's coming up pretty early. So you don't, you don't have that shading effect um, as, as long. Yeah, Jeff. What kind of herbicide program do you guys use? So, um, you know, the website has a lot of different ones. Um, Verdict is kind of the, the traditional one, you know, in, in lower rates of atrazine. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to know those numbers off the top of my head because there's so many different product names and brand names. I'm just going to refer you to that. Um, but there's there's some options um, with longer resistance. You know, and, and when you're looking at a soil in high organic matter, a healthier soil, you're going to process those herbicides a lot faster. So you're going to be able to get away with more. And in wet, warm springs, you're also going to be able to get away with more. And that's why the, the charts we put together have kind of like a half thumb. You know, it's not a thumbs down, it's a half, and some of your legumes might get dinged a little bit. And we just haven't done enough research. Um, and, and the land grants are, are really hitting this hard um, in the next couple of years. But I think we as farmers will figure it out first and already started, are already having done it. Is there any movement for getting the, the folks who do the herbicide labels to do some work on their own so that you've got something on the label that helps you? Because a lot of times, cover crops are an afterthought when they come to do the label. Yeah, so that whether the question whether the herbicide companies and labels will have cover crop suggestion, my understanding is that research is really expensive. And as soon as you put something on a label, you are then legally liable. So I think the short answer is no, they never will. And, unless there's the great hope of more than 50% of Midwest farmers are cover cropping, yeah, then there'll be a push for that. Um, but when, when is that gonna happen? We will have to figure it out far before that. But there is half-lives at least, you know, the, the, that becomes somewhat of a helpful number, but again, Lucas kind of made a comment like, well, it says a 15-month carryover, but I did it anyway. You know? So there's that caveat. I know Bill Curran at Penn State uh, University has done some pretty extensive work. I mean, it might be online. I don't know where it's at, but I know Bill Curran pulled together a lot of that half-life. Right, and, and that chart on that website, Bill Curran sat down with us and and went through and said, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that aligns with my research. So we just simplified it, make it a little more readable and kind of translatable and practical. Missouri's got a lot of work being done on the half lives and how it affects too. It, and the challenge is most of that herbicide work has been done on conventional system where you don't have a lot of soil life. So again, it's not going to apply to a lot of us necessarily. There's there's a few that are yes as we mentioned I know we know one fellow that we're talking to that has been doing this and he's using similar species that we're talking about annual ryegrass and clover and, and the challenge there is great you have no herbicide concerns right so it seems like a real opportunity but usually your last cultivation some years it's right before the canopy closes, so it's not gonna work. And you're often dealing with a more diverse crop rotation, and you're not necessarily wanting peri vetch or anything else in your food grade um, 
grains at all. Like you get docked seriously or re whole loads rejected. So it gets complicated pretty quick. Yeah, so we talked about other modes, uh, the helicopter and the airplane, which are, are kind of tried true and we know some of the issues and the challenges with those specifically. So they, they are an option. Uh, when we get out there, we, we just, I think we're fairly aware of some of the challenges that we have. We know that's what we want to look for, is a good healthy stand underneath that canopy. And, you know, I don't know how much work people are looking at, at more upright type corn from that standpoint. I know where we had success, it was with a very short variety of corn that had a very open can, so that's why that clover was so rich in that. Plus it was about 20 pounds to the acre. Yeah, that's generally what we look at as far as what the stand is in there. And we get real happy, and even in soybeans, uh, a stand like that's not going to interfere with your harvest at all. But she'll will provide that benefit. Leave it there. Talk about those different methods. Uh, Gandy actually made this specifically to mount on the combine headers. So that's something that they actively market. A little diverter underneath the header. 